Athlete Mindset is part of the CadSource Podcast Network. At CadSource, we love podcasts. In fact, we love building podcasts, everything from development to production. Because of all that, we're growing this one-of-a-kind podcast network. If you have a podcast or looking to launch a new podcast, then we should talk. You can message me on Twitter at Eric underscore Kaz or hit us up any way that works for you by searching CadSource on your social media app of choice. This is the Athlete Mindset Podcast, and it's all about mental health in sports. Presented and produced by Sports Eat Plus, part of the CadSource Podcast Network. Athlete Mindset is hosted by Lisa Bontasumi. Lisa is a therapist and mental performance consultant to high-performing athletes at the youth, collegiate, and professional levels. Lisa also works with teams, coaches, and other members of the sports ecosystem. The Athlete Mindset Podcast is a space for conversations with athletes, coaches, practitioners, and stakeholders in sports. And it's where those individuals share their perspectives, experiences, and thoughts on mental health in sports. I am Eric Kazimov, founder of CadSource and the creator of Sports C+. I'm hosting the Athlete Mindset Podcast on this platform as I deeply believe these conversations are essential and deserve to be prioritized. So today I'm super excited to have Marcia Tafarel, also known as Tafa, on the podcast today. Welcome, Marcia. I call you Marcia, not Tafa. That's how I know you. So like, I'm excited to be here with you today. Pleasure, Lisa. So nice to connect with you again. We had an amazing trip to Jordan and now being able to participate with you in the podcast. I really like it. I like these conversations, discussions, uh, and and talking, I think is important. And I appreciate for the, for the invitation. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Yes, we, so funny. We actually live in Northern California here, probably when the traffic is good, about <laughs> 30 to 45 minutes away from each other. But it took us to go on a, a women in soccer exchange together in Jordan, of all places, to actually connect and bond and, and create a friendship. So I, I appreciate you taking the time. I know you're a busy lady. You know, I'm excited for so many reasons to have Marcia have you with us. I see you as a trailblazer in women's soccer, women's football, wherever you are in the country and in the world, the way you speak about it. But like, there's a story that you have that I've started to hear about from you to listen to in our travels together. And I want everyone to hear it. I want people to hear your story, your history with football in Brazil here. So I'm just going to start by giving you some some big ups first, and then we'll have a conversation. <laughs> you know, Marcia is a former Brazilian women's national soccer team player. She competed in two World Cup competitions in China in 1991 and then Sweden in 1995. And she played in the 1996 Olympic Games in Atlanta, Georgia. Marcia was selected the fifth best South American player of the century by the International Federation of Football History and statistics back in 1997, and just has a wealth of knowledge, not just on the pitch, on the field, but as a human being. So I, I want to get in there and have people know you. I'm just excited that you're here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's a long history in, in soccer, you know, in football, like you said, <laughs> depending on what country you, you yeah. are listening to. But it's very proud of, of my path, very proud of what, uh, you know, I, I went through all the experiences that I, I had to go through, the ups and downs, I think made me a stronger woman. Mm-hmm. And right now, what I try to do is to inspire other women. I try to make a difference in the little girls' lives mm-hmm. to pursue their dreams as well. So it's, 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 a, good, it's a good path. <laughs> For sure. Well, let's talk about it. When, where did your path start? I know you have a really amazing story with your mom and you and, and how she, you know, spoke to you and talked to you about soccer and your dreams. Can you share a little bit about like that, that beginning? Let's do it. I could have the whole podcast just talking about the beginning, but let's try <laughs> to summarize. So I start to play soccer in the streets of uh, Brazil, south of Brazil, in the city of Bento Gonçalves, which is an Italian colonization city. Let's mm-hmm. put it that way. Yeah. Uh, so I come from an Italian background. Uh, very strict families, you know, girls have their own rules to to follow, boys have their own rules to follow, and soccer or football was prohibited by law 
in Brazil from 1941 to 1979. So that law folded and they say, okay, now women can play soccer in mm. 1979. But I, I was a little girl in the 70s playing soccer in the streets with boys. And of course, you have the, the people that, you know, because they know the law, they try to make sure that you follow the law, you know. Mm -hmm. And then I have family members that would come to say to me, why are you doing the street playing with the boys? You don't know that the girls cannot play soccer? Go back home, go help your mom. And, you know, you try to tell them, but I already helped my mom, you know, I'm mm -hmm. just having fun. I'm mm -hmm. just, you know, trying to play uh, this sport that I like, you know. But you are a girl, you need to be with girls, you know, so you hear this kind of stuff. And my mom, like you, you told, uh, my mom was ahead of her time. She always was this person that, and, and that comes from my mom, you know, this is strong mind, this kind of, uh, let's go head to head with yeah. people. That let's say challenge that, that stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. my mom was coming outside and saying to my family members, but why? Why she cannot play soccer? It's just a sport. She's not doing anything bad. You know, I know where she is. I know where uh, what she's doing, why she cannot do it. So she was like head to the head with family members saying, no, she can do it. She's mm -hmm. not doing anything wrong. It's just mm -hmm. a sport. So uh, that was the beginning, you know, streets of Bento Gonçalves, playing soccer with the boys. And then at 13 years old, my mom heard about a team in my city that was forming a women's team. And she, you know, searched a little bit about the team or tried to get information about the team. She couldn't find any information. But then she heard that the head coach was a friend of her. And then she went to the, the head coach house and said, look, my daughter, Marcia, she's playing soccer in the streets with the boys. And can she come and, and do a tryout with your team? I know it's a do team, but, uh, you know, you can observe her. You can evaluate if she's in a, that level to play with your team. And, and he said, yes, it's okay. She's young. But if you're going to be with her, then it's okay. Then I went to the tryouts and I made it. I made it because that was my passion. That was what I like to do. It. So Marcia, yeah, I, how old were these ladies that you that you were on this team? You tried. You were thirteen, and how? What age group were they? They were ladies that were a little older, and that, there were uh, girls that were kind of three, four years older than me. So I was the youngest, like thirteen years old, almost fourteen, thirteen and a half. And then I had uh, players that were eighteen, players that were mm. twenty something, players that were thirty something. But I was the youngest for sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no. it's a, a mix of uh, age groups up there, but it was an adult team. So it was, uh, it was not professional because we didn't have professional. Mm -hmm. We are, we were just starting, uh, you know, like I said, the law folded in, in 1979, but the competitions started only in the eighties. So gotcha. I started to, yeah. to play in 1981 with this team, mm -hmm. two years after. Wow. And so, how did you grow to become so confident in your own physical skills, but the maturity as well to kind of keep progressing your career? You're a little girl. These late, some of these ladies could be your mom, um, big sisters. There's probably a lot of adult things going on around you. Like, how did you handle all of that? Uh, Lisa, to be honest, I was a, a, a girl that was very responsible. My mm. mindset was different than the little girls that like to play with the dolls. Uh, you mm. know, my mindset was, you know, strong. And, and because I had a whole model to follow, mm. you know, my mom was not the kind of uh, woman that, uh, you know, uh, was with me, me, me for things, you know, or cry for little things that happen in her life. She was like, okay, this happened to me. I'm going to, you know. If I fall down, I'm going to get up again and keep going, you know. So I had really good whole model in my house. I, I followed the, the footsteps of my mom in this sense, in, in her mindset, because she was a strong woman. And I, I had to go through some discrimination to be able to play soccer. And I had that strong mind. I said, that is what I want. That is what I'm going to pursue. And I have my mom to support me as well. So. This was really important, the support of my mom, because, of course, you go through, uh, you know, some stuff that you feel 
kind of weak. And then you hear from her, hey, you are, you are planting the seed. You know that you're going to need to go through this stuff. So you need to remember that you are, you are one of the first ones. You are fighting with the discrimination. You are fighting against prejudice. So ah. you need to go through this, this kind of stuff because you are, you are paving you are paving the path yes. for the other players that are going to come after you, yes. you know? Yes. So she was already putting this in my mind and I'm like, okay, you know, I'm going to pave this path. I'm going to make the, the way better for the other players that are coming to me uh, after me. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that mindset that my mom helped me to have and, you know, all the situation in the house and the family members with family members that I had to go through also helped me. Not only family members, but neighbors, you know, people that mm. would come and say, no, you cannot do that. And you mm -hmm. have to fight to do it or you have to discuss to tell them, why not? What yeah. are you doing wrong? You know, a am I robbing somebody? I'm, uh, I'm not a thief. I'm not robbing some mm -hmm. anybody. So I'm doing everything that is in the law. So I, I don't see why I cannot do it, you know. Absolutely. I mean, I think what you're speaking about is, you know, that your mom was already sort of training you and creating you to be a leader and to be someone who paves the way, someone who trailblazes, someone who is creating history and impacting those generations after you. And not only is she asking you to do that and encouraging you, but she's there to support you. She's not going to exactly. say, go Marcia, go do it. Bye. Have fun. Like she's there with you and encouraging you, supporting you, giving you what you need. I think that's a crucial piece. Exactly. All the way. And uh, I think I told you in, in Jordan, we had a little conversation that mm -hmm. she became the, the do all in the team. You know, she started to follow me in the games. And then uh, she noticed that, you know, the, the players had to wash their uniform. And she was like, no, nope, I'm going to be the one that is going to wash the uniforms. Just give me the uniform and I'm going to be the one watching. And then after that, we, we had to get uh, money to be able to travel. Okay. I have some friends. I'm going to connect with this, some friends that, uh, you know, maybe can help. So she started to do all, you know. Okay, we don't have lunch, you know, in a trip that we're going to go. We don't have lunch. We don't have money to, to buy the bread, the, the ham, the, the cheese to make, a, you know, a little sandwich for mm -hmm. each player. Mm -hmm. a, a little kit with, you know, bottled water, lunch. Oh, and she would, That's awesome. Uh, so we were not a, a rich family. But mm -hmm. what she was able to do it to help, she would do it. So she would, she started to do a little bit of everything besides being my mom and encouraging yeah. me to go through the, the past. So she became the mom of all the players. To yeah. Be <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think that, again, it's a community. It's a, it becomes a family, right? You're traveling exactly. together. You're together. I mean, I think that this is such a good, important reminder for all of our young girls who are playing now about the 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 simple, simple ways we can support that mean so much. Yet yeah. she didn't have to buy this, that, and the other thing, but she was there. She gave up her time, her energy, her, her knowledge, her, her spunk to all of it. So I really love it because then at age 16, you moved out of your hometown, right? I was already 17. Okay. Uh, 16 was my first trip out of the state. So okay. I went to another state to play. So from 13 to 16, I play only in South of Brazil in the state of Rio Grande do Sul. Mm -hmm. At 16 was my first trip out of the state. I went to another state to play a tournament. And then 17 is when I, 17, almost 18 is when I move out of the state to live in another big city. Wow. And so did mom come with you there? What was that transition like? So when I was invited to play in Sao Paulo State, that is the big state where things happen, yep. my mom went to the first trip with me, but after she said, okay, now you're going to fly with your wings, you mm -hmm. know, because she was not able to, to follow me anymore, mm -hmm. uh, because now I'm going to another state. So what I, uh, what I was doing is I was working, I was well, uh, I had a job. I had to leave my job on Friday evening, get a bus from south of Brazil to Sao Paulo, which is 18 hours bus, get there Saturday morning, practice Saturday afternoon, play Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon, 
come back from Sao Paulo to Rio Grande do Sul, back, get a bus around 8, 8 p.m., 9 p.m., get back to Rio Grande do Sul, get there Monday morning and go work on Monday afternoon. So that was my routine. And my mom, of course, also was working at that time. And she said, I'm not going to be able to go in every single trip with you anymore because I need to work on Monday. I need to work on Friday. So she said, now you're going to fly with your, your own, own wings. And, and it was fine because I was a very responsible girl. I showed her and she was confident that I would be able to, to go by myself in those trips. Yeah. And, and that is what I did to pursue, you know, the next step, you know, exactly. because when you start to, when you start to develop in a soccer, my state didn't have tournaments for me to play anymore because of this mental, you know, strictness that, uh, okay, soccer is for girls now, but, uh, you know, in our state is not yet. Yes, so they, they exactly. Didn't, they didn't organize many tournaments. And I want to develop, I want to play. So my mom said, okay, now you need to go to another state to be able to develop even more. If you have this dream to, you know, become a professional player. Mm -hmm. And it's what I did. I I did all those trips to be able to to pursue a dream that I want to be a professional player. Or at least, you know, develop better to maybe go to a national team because mm-hmm. that was my dream. Oh, now that soccer is developing, mm-hmm. now I have, maybe they're going to have a national team and I'll be able to be part, you know? Of so course. those dreams that a, a girl have when they, they pursue sport. But I think the, though, I mean, what is so important, what you're saying that, you know, everyone has to know that there's hard work ahead. You can say, oh, I want to play for this team or this league or professionally or for my national team or whatever. But I think in our country these days, it's so glorified to be able to do that, that we don't put enough attention to the hard work behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're talking about is so important that it's not only hard work for you, but for her and the rest of your family. I mean, we haven't even touched on the responsibilities there of like your siblings and everything else. You're not the only child. And there's a family to take care of, you know, and to earn a living for, et cetera. But I think, yeah, leave and spread your wings. I think these days that's just as hard for the parents as it is for the kid. Don't you think? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? No, totally. And, and you touching a base that was very important. I was providing for my family was well. Was mm-hmm. well. So I was working to help the, the family income. Yes. So when when my mom said, now you need to fly with uh, your own wings, and I was doing all this uh, because I didn't want to leave the job that I had because I was helping the family. Mm. But of course, when she felt that, you know, I was developing a soccer field, you know, I want to pursue my dreams of becoming, you know, a really good soccer player to maybe go to a national team because they start the zoom, 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 you know, this was end of the 80s already. Uh-huh. So they start to, to have conversations that they would have, uh, you know, a national team because FIFA was thinking to start a World Cup, but they didn't know exactly what year. So this was 87 when I was like, okay, now I'm, I need to move to Sao Paulo to pursue this dream. Uh-huh. And, and then I had to make the decision to leave my job in South of Brazil and with that comes, you know, the responsibility that you were saying, how I'm going to help my family now? Because now I need to move to a new state, not only play soccer, but also work because I mm. still need to continue to provide and help my family. And now I need to provide for myself because now I don't have, you know, the house, my mom's house to live anymore. So there is all these steps that goes through your mind, how I can help my family, how I can help myself how I can provide for myself and continue my education because I was going to school as well. Mm. I was a high school student. So I was like, how am I going to do all this? And you need to go step by step, you know, because it is hard to move from one city to another state, a new city. I had help. I had some support in the beginning, but after you need to provide for yourself. So there is all these responsibilities and, and still, you know, 
the mindset is like, I'm going to be able to do it. I'm going to do it, you know, because mm -hmm. you, you were encouraging. My mom encouraged me to do it when she said, okay, now you're going to go and you're going to fly by yourself. You're going to, she was telling me, I know you can do it. Mm -hmm. If I'm letting you go and I'm letting you know that you can do that mm -hmm. it's because I have confidence that you are able to do it. So this made all the difference. So the belief that she had in you was like fuel, you know, was IV confidence, right? You know, like she could, she could just insist that you have totally. it and there it is. I mean, it's totally. so, so totally. unwavering. It's amazing. I mean, your, your story of going to school, leaving your hometown, being away from your family and your parents and, you know, your regular job, what you know is equivalent to these days of a collegiate athlete, you know, leaving for school. You know, yeah. leaving from high school to college and maybe leaving, right? There's yeah. so many stressors that go on there. Like you just listed, are you going to be working? How do you handle all the travel, being independent, going to school, doing your homework, <laughs> you know, training, all of that besides your mom. And we, everyone needs to have supportive community, supportive system of friends, family, whoever they might be. What do you think was really, really important? Like maybe one or two things that was really important in addition to that, to help you with that transition? Well, like I said, I had the support when I transitioned from south of Brazil to Sao Paulo. Mm -hmm. I went to live in a house mm -hmm. where the, the president of the club that I was going to was a family with more condition, more, you know, they, they were healthy, let's put it away. So they embraced me. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that the president did is like, I'm going to go to your hometown. I'm going to talk with your mom to let her know that I'm going to give the support that you need to do this transition. So mm. when I transitioned from south of Brazil, I didn't transition to live in a republic with other players. He embraced me and he put me in his family house. Mm. So with his dad, with his mom, with his brothers, and he said, look, you are the first player that I'm bringing to my home because I made a commitment with your mom that I will support you in this transition. And I had that support of the president of the club at that time. His name was Romeo. So I was there for two, three months in his house. And then I transitioned because I got a job. And I, then I went to live with another player that I had a son but he needs help with the, the rent because she was not able to support herself. And then uh, the president said, oh, hold on, have this player in a team that needs a roommate. So maybe now that you have a job, you can live with her and, and share mm. the, the rent with her. So I did that because also you start to feel uncomfortable living with the president because you feel that you are more protected than the other place. Yeah. <laughs> all these things going in your mind. You understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Yes. So after yes. two months that I transitioned from south of Brazil to Sao Paulo, I said, okay, thank you very much, but let's try to do other arrangements where I can provide for myself now that I have a job. You were worried, Marcia, that like that, you, that it would be seen as favoritism or like... Yes. Totally. I see. Okay. Okay. Totally. Gotcha. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And, and that makes I sense. Didn't want that. Mm -hmm. You know, because you start to feel the zoom, zoom, zoom. Oh, she, she yeah. lives in the house of the president. Yeah. And it's just temporary. I'm, I'm not going to live there forever. I'm just, you know, transitioning and trying to find a job to, to be able to provide for myself. Mm -hmm. Then this happened two months after, you know, two months after, because I, w I was still go staying two weeks in his house and then going back to home and then come back and then stay two weeks. So the transition was not just go and move. It, yeah. The transition was kind of slow. When I got the job, then I, I was able to do this arrangement where I was going to live with this player that had a son and she needs help with the rent. And then I totally transitioned from south of Brazil to, to Sao Paulo at that time. Because I was working, I was providing for myself. I had to give a little break in school because I didn't find a school where I was able to work and study. Mm -hmm. Then after that, I was able to, mm -hmm. to also find the, the school that I was able to, to study as well. Wow. Wow. I mean, that's super inspiring. I mean, I think that there's so much any parent and any player can learn at, about what you're talking about, the sacrifices, the flexibility, the support system. 
Of course, you know, the Brazilian culture is different here in the U.S. Like the intergenerational families are a norm. Everybody living together and supporting one another, right? And then the gradual transition away is normalized. I think here it's like, oh, you're 18. You got to be on your own all, all the way. Like, go, mm-hmm. go do it. You know, there's that expectation that, oh, if, if you're not, you're a little bit too dependent on your family and that, that there's a cultural difference there. Yeah. 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 And, and the difference probably in the culture in Brazil is that most of the kids live with their parents, but they need to start to work really, really early to provide and help in the income of the family. So, for example, yes, I was living pretty much until 17, almost 18 with my family, but I was working since I was 14 years old. Mm-hmm. I was helping my family. When I was 14, I started working at a company. It's like a company that makes a wallet and, and, oh, okay. and help. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I started to work in this company full time and was studying at night to provide uh, for my family as well. So in Brazil, the culture is like the parents want to have the kids close to them. Yeah. But uh, with my mom was different because I had a dream. I have a, the dream to pursue to be a soccer player, you know, yes. to provide for my, for my family with soccer. Right. But uh, I totally understand. Yeah. I mean... We could do a whole nother series of podcast episodes on this piece, yeah, but I think yeah. it's, again, really, really important for people to hear. Tell us about how it started your direct pursuit to play for the Brazilian women's national team. You were selected at age 20. What was that selection process like? And what was that transition like onto that team? So that was the first selection for a tournament in China. So what mm. FIFA did, instead of, being, instead of organizing the first World Cup in China, what they did, oh, let's do an international tournament to see if there is interest mm. in women's mm-hmm. soccer. Mm-hmm. So in 1988, they organized this international tournament in China because China would be the first country to, to organize the, the first World Cup in 1991. But first they had this international tournament, which Brazil was invited to participate. So what they did, they select players that were, you know, in one specific team in Rio de Janeiro, they call Radar. That team was the best team in Brazil, was the team that was providing more for players. They were considered professional players. Mm-hmm. Most of the players that play soccer at that time, they had to work and play. Mm-hmm. This specific team, the players only play soccer. They didn't need to work outside. So they were really ahead of other players because they were able to practice in two periods, morning and afternoon. Mm-hmm. I was in good shape because I was in a work where my job was starting 11.30 a.m., and I was leaving 9.30 p.m. So I had early mornings for praxis, which I was doing by myself. I didn't have a personal trainer. Mm-hmm. So I, I had a person that was responsible for conditioning and strength in a team. And he wrote what I needed to do. It, you know, So it, myself, I was going 7 a.m. in the morning to do my training. Then work from 11 to 9.30 and doing uh, school online, online school. Mm. To finish high school and start to, to go uh, towards college gr- degree. So I finish my high school towards online education and then work until 9.30 p.m. And then weekends I was free because we work Monday to Friday. So weekends was game time, practice Saturday with the, the team, but I was in good conditioning. And I was like being one of the best players in my team. So what they did, they chose a couple of players from different states besides the base radar mm-hmm, was mm-hmm. the base of the team. Mm-hmm. And then they chose 15 more players in different states. So Sao Paulo, I think, got five players selected. Bahia, that was another state. Three more players, four more players. Total, total in the national team was invited around 30 players. So they would cut half of those players because only 16 would travel. Mm-hmm. And at that time, I was in transition between jobs as well. So I was in, an, in, in one kind of job and I got a new job that would pay me more 
So okay. I just started in, in this new job that uh, provide me more money. And now I, ne I needed to make the decision because I received the selection. Hey, you were selected for the national team that is going to play the tournament in China. And we're going to be practicing in Rio de Janeiro for a couple months. And I'm like, oh, gosh, what I do of my life? Because mm -hmm. I just started this new mm -hmm. job with Provide Me. Mm -hmm. I'm selected for the first national team. I have the chance to be cut because, you know, the base was Radar, this team that I was telling you, that mm -hmm. we had players that was practicing two, in two uh, sessions. And I was practicing by myself. Should I choose job over soccer? But I came to do this. I came to Sao Paulo to do this. Mm -hmm. But I had to choose my job. You know why? Because the players that was going to, to the national team didn't get paid for. Mm -hmm. They didn't have a payment to, to be able to represent Brazil in this tournament. Mm -hmm. They had just the, the hotel paid for. They had the food paid for. But they didn't have a salary. And the job that I was transitioning to would pay me a good amount of money. I was able to support myself and, and save some money, you know. And I said, can I toss everything in the air and say, no, I'm going to play soccer. And I, I decided not to accept the first selection. So this was 1988 for the tournament. Then 1991, FIFA said, first World Cup, China. Mm -hmm. Now I was three years working in this job. Oh, two years and a half working this job. And then I was talking to my bosses and say, look, it's the second chance that I have to go represent the national team. And the first tournament will be the South America or Copa America tournament that they call. That is the qualified to go to the World Cup. Uh -huh. So it was only one month that I will be out of the, the job. So I got my vacation time, what they call he is the... Uh, you know, time off, like yes, when yes. you have vacation. Mm -hmm. So I got my vacation time around of the tournament and I was able to, to accept the selection. So I went in 91 to play the, the Copa America. We won the Copa America and we qualified to the World Cup. Mm. Wow. Now is coming the decision. Yes. Because now I need to practice for a couple months with the national team to go to China to play the World Cup. Now I need to make another decision, tough yep. decision. Marcia, who is guiding you with these decisions though? You're a young girl still. Like who's guiding you? Are you doing, are you just depending on yourself? Myself, what? myself, because okay. at this time I was providing for myself, you know, the president of the club that I was playing for. He didn't help me anymore with any yeah. kind of money support because I was working. Mm. So of course I, I get the advice of my mom. mom what do you think, yes. you know, yes. uh, call my mom and, yeah. and be yeah. in the phone for one hour. But mom, yeah. how is the World <laughs> Cup? And mm -hmm. I had this job for three years. But uh, they're going to pay you for you to go to the World Cup? No, mom, they're mm. just going to give some help, you know. Like, it's not a money that I'm making a, in a job, but, uh, yeah. you know, it's some help now. Now we're going to have some help, but it's not the same amount that I get in a job. Mm -hmm. And you need to make those tough decisions because, yes. you know, what do you want to pursue? Do you want to still be a soccer player or do you want to work only in this, you know, full-time job that you have? And yes. I still have the dream to pursue soccer was a, a, a full-time job, you know? <laughs> so yeah. I was like, no, I want to go to the World Cup. I want to play for the national team. And she said, that is a decision that you can make now because you don't depend on me anymore. You don't depend on your dad. It's your decision. Make your decision. Be confident with that decision. And mm. I did. I, did. I, I left mm. my job. I accept mm. the selection. And again, you need to go to the process of, it's like tryouts for the national team. You need of to be course. able to practice. You are select for the national team, but you need to go through the tryouts and see if you're going to make it. Yes. <laughs> you know? yes. And fortunately, fortunately for me, I was able to, to have, uh, you know, a good, good time, good, good performance in the national team. And I was able to, to make it to the World Cup. So No, it's amazing. I mean, the story, again, it, it's... We need two, three days of conversation. Yes, I know. We could like just veer off in so many different ways. But I think that, again, for those who are listening here, maybe in this country and abroad, that for Marcia, the decision was working 
or soccer, but maybe that's not your decision, but there's a a very important decision that's being made. Maybe it's like, do I, do I leave my family? Do I play in this state or this country? Because we live in a different time now. I think that at least in America. Decisions that is going to affect the future as well, because you go to the World Cup, you come back, you don't have job to continue. Exactly. To continue to provide for yourself. So it's like, exactly. what I do. Again, the glorification, you. though, of the sort of public facing process of what athletes go through does yeah. not talk enough about this, about yeah. the sacrifice, these big decisions, you know, weighing this and that, where your heart is, is a lot of pressure. Yeah, totally. And sometimes I relate it to the fights that the, the, the US women have to equal pay and things like that. Yes. Or, you know, or players that complain that, uh, you know, to play professional is tough because, uh, you know, the clubs, the professional clubs here, maybe before didn't pay enough for, for them to, to say, oh, no, I want to be a professional player. Sometimes players uh, de- decide not to pursue the professional leagues here because sometimes when they go to, to another job, they're going to be able to make more than being a professional player here. So. I relate yes. to these fights because decisions in the past that I had to do, it was about that, you know? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. No, I appreciate you bringing that up. And I think that there's so much gender inequity in our world. And it's, it's also manifest in, in football and soccer because I think that sport, our sport, reflects the world. Like it, even in the world, women don't get paid the same as men for equal jobs, the same responsibility. So I think that fight is super important. I mean, how how do you feel about the Women's World Cup coming up this summer? What are your thoughts? How are you feeling like off the pitch and on like this gender equity, these issues, as well as these teams coming together? You know, I I see such improvement in, in a fight for equality, for equity, because it's it's like when we talk about, you know, the 90s, it's one thing. You are planting the seed, like I said, mm-hmm. you know. You know that uh, you're going to need to fight uh, many things, you know. But now, 30 years after, 40 years after, you start to feel that the women in any, any country, any place, should not be inviting themselves or kicking heads again with uh, mm-hmm. the federations to fight for better uh, structure, to fight for better pay, because this, uh, you know, is supposed to be done already, you know. I think uh, women's soccer uh, or women's football, how you call, should have this structure and, and professional players should not think about, you know, uh, can I have enough money to provide for myself and you still have many countries that this do- doesn't happen you know if you think about african countries or what those players need to go through to be able to represent them, their country is is crazy you know but mm-hmm. i think in terms of structure what they have now is much better you know the the, the stru- structure of training you know is much better i think is is a little bit more equal in Brazil, at least, uh, and I compare Brazil, U.S., because it's the two countries that uh-huh. I have connections. Uh-huh. Brazil women's uh, team now play in the same center training that the men's practice. Before, mm-hmm. no. Before, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in the 90s, you have to travel around the country to see facilities that support women's soccer and say, yes, you, you guys can be here for two weeks, and then you need to move to another facility. Ah, now you can be here for two more weeks and then you can practice. So a way to train, a way to get, uh, you know, support was different than the girls have right now. Mm. So I feel that that sense improved a lot. The payment needs to, in Brazil, we're still fighting. Yes. Because, you know, a top professional women's soccer player gets, let's suppose, I'm going to talk in dollar now because of, yep. of course the currency in Brazil is different. Yes. But at top professional soccer player in Brazil, women's soccer player in Brazil, get around around $20,000 a year. Mm. Mm. If you compare with the men's top soccer player in Brazil, yep. Yep. <laughs> it's like... We don't even... It's a yeah, one, you know? Yeah. It's, mm. it's uh, 
I would say, 100 times more than exactly. Than women. Yep. So it's like, oh, gosh, you know, there is all this difference that, uh, unfortunately, maybe he in U.S., you don't compare to other countries because U.S. fought and they now are getting equal pay. Uh, mm -hmm. There is other countries that have equal pay. Denmark, I think uh, Norway is fighting mm -hmm. for, Australia mm -hmm. is fighting for mm -hmm. the federation. Mm -hmm. So Brazil is like years behind in this. Yes. Case. And you and I, you know, we shared this past, you know, week together in Jordan and the, the capacity there trying to develop women's soccer there at the national team level, three teams they have now, three different age levels in their first team is, you know, they're so open and knowledgeable. There's just, you know, the culture, you know, and the religion still around should they play, can they play, and learning that in that country, a, a Islamic country, the ways that the girls can express their religion on a continuum was something that I really learned, yeah. uh, that everyone is different, every family is different. Um, just like here, it makes sense. Here in the U.S., everyone might express their religion on a continuum whether it's Christianity or um, Islam yeah. or any other religion. But I think that, that there's still quite a bit of obstacles that, that influence the equal pay piece. And, you know, I'm keeping my eye on it. I know you are. Yeah. What do you do every day? I mean, what's your daily life like? And I, I think there was, you know, I, I have to say, you know, when we were in Jordan, we each got some very important pieces of news from our, in our own lives that we shared with one another, another. You shared, which is still, I still get chills about it, that you are the U.S. Women's Futsal National Head Coach, which is amazing. Congratulations again. And I remember when the texts were coming through and you're like, oh my God, they're going to announce it, this and that. And then you're like, oh gosh, there's so many, I have so many firsts. I yeah. remember you saying that. And like, I think there was like a moment of pause there in our conversation about that. Like, what does it mean to you to, you know, come from where you've come from, had your journey and now, now be here? Yeah, no, uh, it's crazy. It's like I said to you, it's crazy to think about it because every single first uh, I was there, you know, first World Cup for women's soccer, I was there, 1991. Even though they had the tournament in 1988, it was not official World Cup. Mm -hmm. I was selected. I was not there. But in the first Women's World Cup by FIFA, I was there, 1991. First Women's Soccer participation in the Olympic Games, mm -hmm. I was there, 1996. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when I moved to U.S. Uh, to pursue the transition to be a coach here in U.S., because I was finishing my player career and I was transitioning. I was looking for more education to be a good coach. I was coaching futsal in Brazil. Look, look the craziness. <laughs> I was coaching futsal in Brazil with a team that was really strong, top, top team, juvenile, uh, we say junior. Before okay. adult team, you coach the junior team. Mm -hmm. So I was coaching the junior team that was top in Brazil. We were just Brazilian champions in the first tournament for that age group. And then I decided to come to U.S. to uh, get the English a little bit better because I was studying English in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And my best friend here in U.S. was playing professional here, Cici do Amor. And then I told her, can I pass my vacation in, to learn English? And she said, come, 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 but bring some paperwork that if you decide to stay a little longer, you can stay and, you know, pursue even more your education if you want. And if you want to come back to, to play soccer here, I think that you can do even with 30, 35, 36. I think you still can, can play for a, more years here. And I said, really? Are you sure? <laughs> because here in Brazil, you pass 30 years old, you are considered old to play. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, are you sure I still can play at 35 years old? And she said, just bring the paperwork. <laughs> then you decide. Then you decide what right. to do after. Right. And exactly. So gave me all the, the support to come. She, you know, she she put me in her house. And and anyway, I was here for for a couple of days. And the idea was to stay only in a one month vacation that I had. You know. Yeah. <laughs> because I was working. I was coaching there. And then 
I, I said, I'm not going to go back. I'm not going to go back. I'm going to, I'm going to stay here. And then we applied for new visa. I got the, the new visas. Uh, what were you feeling, Marcia, that made it so clear that you wanted to stay? It's like all the support that I had here. Because you say, oh, I play for the national team. In, if you say, I play for the national team in Brazil, in Brazil, it's like people say, oh, really? Oh, yeah. good for you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, yeah. Mm. Uh, you know? Yeah. Like whatever. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, whatever. Exactly. You say, he, U.S., I played for the Brazilian national team and I played two World Cups and I played Olympics. They bow yes. on you, you know? Yes, like, yes, they bow you. You did it. What amazing. Uh -huh. And then, you know, they want to take pictures with you. It's like I told you, you feel a celebrity. Like you feel like a celebrity. Even, even you are in the end of your career with 35 years old, you are a celebrity. And then you start to play around here. You know, when I came, I started to play around just for fun. And you feel that you are in a high level still, you know? And, yeah. And you start to feel confident. And I, and then I start to play semi-pro here. So I went to play with Sis in a, in a semi-pro team, WPSL, California Storm. And mm -hmm. then I got my visa. I went back to college here to learn uh, English was a second language, but then decided to do the physical education degree that was in Emiro in Brazil, and I was not able to finish. Then I finished here. And I was like, I'm going to stay. So what supposed to be one month became 19 years. And this opportunity to coach in a U.S. futsal national team is like, seems that everything God is putting a way yes. to happen, you know? Yes. The, uh, sorry, I'm Catholic, so I say God because, you know. So I was coaching futsal. I, I gave up everything in Brazil, coaching the top team in Brazil. I came to U.S., started to coach soccer, football, you know, 11 v 11, or 7 versus 7, or 9 versus 9. That is the way that, uh, you know, soccer is, is developed here. And then, but I was playing futsal because, like I said, you feel that you, you still can go, in, you know? Yeah. So parallel to the semi-pro league, I was playing futsal leagues here because I have a friend that have a league here. And every single time that they, they promote leagues here, I was putting the teams that I were coaching that was little ones or, you know, teenagers, I was putting, putting them to, to play futsal because I said, Futsal is a good tool for you guys to develop your soccer skills. Mm -hmm. So when you play futsal in small space, when you go to the soccer field, you're going to feel more confident. Mm -hmm. And I start to play too here, futsal. And then comes this job application that my friend sent to me and said, apply right now. And I was like telling him, but I don't coach futsal here. I coach soccer here. But you coach in Brazil, so apply right now. He was, in, you know, encouraging me. Mm -hmm. Ricardo da Silva is his name. And he kind of forced me to apply. And I said, okay, I'm going to apply only because you are asking. So I applied <laughs> to, do, to the job end of August last year, 2022. September, I got the email. Hey, we would like to have, a, you know, an interview, first interview with you just to, to go over your background and to talk a little bit about you and your experience. And I said, great, let's have the, the interview. Went through the first interview. Then I went to vacation in Brazil in December. I was in Brazil. Got the second interview there. And then they say to me, look, we would like to meet you face to face in Atlanta. When you come back to the U.S. And I said, beginning of January. And then they say, January 11th. Can you come <laughs> to Atlanta? And I was like, I need to talk to my club because I'm just coming back from vacation. I need to take a, more days off from, from coaching to go to Atlanta. And I, then I find cover for my teams. And anyway, went to Atlanta on January 11. And then there I, I learned that there was two finalists for the job, myself from West Coast and another guy from the East Coast. So we had the whole day of activities in their view and the, in the end of the day they say look you guys are the two finalists and we decide that marcia is going to be the head coach and you uh, sasha is his name is going to be the assistant coach are you guys okay with each other and i said no problem with the connections that we had mm -hmm, there in mm -hmm. the activities that we did i said of course no problem appreciate thank you so much for the confidence there January 11 is where I learned that I was going to be the head coach. 
But they say that they would take a little while to announce because they need to write the announcement to put in the website, blah, blah, right. blah. Right, yes. This took a couple months. And then, like I said, when I was in Jordan with yes. you, I said, ooh, they can <laughs> announce. They can <laughs> announce. And then I start to receive texts and texts and texts and messages. And I was like, holy cow, it's happening. <laughs> So, so amazing. crazy. So amazing. I love it. I'm so happy for and, you. And, 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 and like you said, the, the first thing that came in my mind is like, first, U.S. Yes, yes. women's futsal head coach. Because, of course, you had teams that represent U.S. before, but it was not a U.S. national team. That's team right. US soccer. That's so right. I'm like, holy cow, it's another first. Yeah. Yeah. And the and the belief in yourself, the humility, the the hard work, the just down to earthness about you is is you know what has uh, seen you through this journey. And there's more journeys to be had. I mean, this is just the beginning of another chapter for you. It's so exciting. So I know that we also shared a moment because during the, our time together in Jordan during that visit, I shared with you. Oh, my niece just signed with Santos FC in Brazil of all countries. And look who I'm with right now, who I'm sitting, like, like you said. Please tell the name of your niece again. Yes. Reina, Reina Bonta. Yes. Reina Bonta. Yes. They call her the queen, which is so the funny. Bonpinha. They call her the, the queen. queen. As you recall, everybody, Inha, you know, Rosana, Rosaninha. Gotcha. Marcinha. <laughs> so now I'm calling, I'm not calling her Reininha, I'm calling her Boninha or Boninha. Boninha. <laughs> Boninha. <laughs> right. But it's funny because I watched one of her games this weekend and the, in, in Portuguese, of course. Like, <laughs> they're like, Lorena. I'm like, yeah. it's so yeah. cute. Reina. But anyways, yeah. and so, so I told you, of course. We were probably sitting on the bus together at the time or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we were on that, we were at that pit stop to get coffee. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> On our way to our next programming piece. But, and then, oh, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to text, I'm, I'm going to text Christiane to ask about her. <laughs> <laughs> and Christiane, you know, Christiane is the top player. She's yes, she the, is. The, the player that used to play for the Brazilian national team. Yes. And I said, I have Christiane's contact. I'm going to ask about her, Reina. And then I got the feedback that Raina is a really good defender. So your niece is high level up there. <laughs> She's good. She has a big brain on her to yes, help her yes. think. But I thought that was funny. And then you're like, oh, Christiane, she, she left me a voice message. And then it yes. was all, it, it, you were translating it to me because it was on Portuguese. Yeah. You're like, duh, duh, duh. Yeah. I was like, she said that really? Oh my God. So yeah. I appreciate just, you know, the moments that we've shared, this moment, this time together. You're very inspirational. Can I tell you something about that? Yes, It's please. so funny. When you told me that your niece was playing in Santos in Brazil, I said, really? <laughs> because normally the Brazilian players wants to come to US to play. Mm -hmm. What made Reina to go to Brazil to play? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was a mm -hmm. nice, uh, you know, interaction. Because when you yes. told me, I was like surprised to know about that. And at the same time, happy that America wants to go to Brazil to play the Brazilian league which makes sense because Brazil is developing a nice league, a good league. I think it's a good competition. But it's like I said, surprise for me because most of the Brazilian players wants to come to US to play. Well, yeah, I remember you saying that, but I think that we value Brazilian soccer almost more than Brazilians value Brazilian soccer here. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, that's the club that Pele played for. I mean, like, there's yeah. so many stars that play for Neymar that Neymar played for yes. Santos. Neymar. So Robinho played for Santos. So many players. Santos is a really club developer for, for men's players and now also for women's uh, because they, they really have a good program, a women's soccer program up there. So mm -hmm. really glad. Yeah. So, so I know our family, it's like, you know, for her, any opportunity to play. And interestingly enough, you know, she's the only American starting with, with all the other 10 Brazilian players. And like, that's a learning experience for her. That's amazing for her to be there. I know she's picking up Portuguese. She's she tells me it's like such an amazing experience. It's like a family. Say bom dia already. Boa tarde. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna to text her Portuguese. Yeah. To the bay. 
So no, it's amazing. I, I mean, again, amazing. we could talk for hours and maybe we will, but we should go like, you know, go for a walk or go for coffee or something soon. But I just appreciate mm-hmm. the opportunity to share in this conversation with you and keep following all the amazing things you're doing and the contributions you're making to young girls, women in soccer, not just on the field, but in their lives. I I saw you coaching in Jordan and the inter- way you interact with the girls is just super sweet and just amazing and lovely. And, and let's just be clear too, Marcia is still very competitive. She was out there, big eyes, like this and that, running around. It's just such a great role model for all of us to have. And just thank you again for spending some time with me today. No, it was a pleasure. And like I said, we should have, you know, two, three days of conversation because it's, it's like I said, that it's fun to talk about, you know, your experience, but even more, you know, to share this with other people. Uh, this weekend, I was in Santa Clara with a futsal tournament, scouting and, mm-hmm. and looking the future of futsal. And it's amazing because, you know, people comes to you and wants to take picture with you. It's like I said, I was feeling a celebrity. I was like, oh, gosh, so many pictures, so many, many people coming and contacting you. And now you feel that you can make such a difference, you mm-hmm. know, you can make a, a really impacting in, in girls' lives because, you know, they see you and they say, she is the U.S. futsal head coach now. Mm-hmm. And they can see, you know, the future. They can vision where they want to go, you know. Yes. Vision. And they come and ask, oh, what do I need to do it, you know, to be able to get to that level? And I mm-hmm. said, continue to develop, continue to play futsal. I know most of you guys play soccer, but continue to, to develop in a futsal level as well. Any tournament, any, any way that you can develop your skills, futsal is a way also to, are great to develop his skills. So it's amazing. It's it is amazing. amazing. Gosh, the last 30 years, you know, where women's soccer has gone, I wonder in the next 30 years where it will be. We'll have another conversation at that point too to, to reflect. But do it. Let's do it. I, it. I appreciate you. I'll see you soon, okay? Appreciate it, Lisa. Thank you so much. Athlete Mindset is part of the Source Podcast Network. At CadSource, we love podcasts. In fact, we love building podcasts, everything from development to production. Because of all that, we're growing this one-of-a-kind podcast network. If you have a podcast or looking to launch a new podcast, then we should talk. You can message me on Twitter at Eric underscore Kaz or hit us up any way that works for you by searching CadSource on your social media app of choice. Let's talk about your podcast joining this one-of-a-kind podcast network, the CadSource Podcast Network.